This week, Mike finds a little furry friend in his video game shoebox. Johnny chats to Aussie caster Mitch Leslie, who packed up and moved to Germany to follow his dreams. And we catch up with Kelly Hu to find out what goes into making a fight scene with Hugh Jackman. This is Player Attack. Hi, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this week saw eSports hit the Philippines with ESL hosting a Dota 2 tournament in Manila. Eight teams from around the world paid a visit to Southeast Asia for a big weekend full of MOBA action. The finals on Sunday were full of the upsets that make eSports exciting. Fan favourite Fnatic fumbled in the first semi, falling to Chinese team Wings. And it was that same dark horse that crushed Team Liquid's undefeated weekend in the one game that really counted, taking out the grand final and a cool 100,000 bucks in a thrilling 3-0 matchup. And sticking with eSports for a moment, ESL has ruled that Team YP is no longer welcome at any further events thanks to the team's sponsor. And before you wonder why it matters where a team's money comes from, the YP in their name comes from major funding partner, adult entertainment website, YouPorn. Turns out ESL has a strict rules. No drugs, no alcohol, no pornography. Which makes sense when you think about the international audience watching esports these days and the myriad of broadcasters involved. The team has competed in all sorts of esporting events, ranging from Counter-Strike to League of Legends to Evolve, and has offered to remove the YP branding, which it's competed under since December 2014. As yet, ESL has not responded. There's a couple of big delays this week. The first one is just a rumour at this stage, but it sounds like Guerrilla Games' upcoming robot dinosaur epic Horizon Zero Dawn has been pushed back into 2017, disappointing everyone who was hoping to have it by Christmas. The upside is that the rumour also suggests the game is being tweaked to work beautifully on the also rumoured PlayStation 4K. The second delay, unfortunately, comes directly from the publisher as EA confirms Mirror's Edge Catalyst won't quite meet its May 26 release date. Instead, the team at DICE is taking just a little while longer to get the game and its social play features up to scratch, so it'll be released on June 7 instead. And in more bittersweet news, Microsoft has officially ended production of the Xbox 360 after 10 years on the market. This doesn't mean your console will suddenly stop working, of course. Xbox Live will be supported for the foreseeable future, but it does mean that if you are struck down by the red ring of death, you won't be able to just pop out and buy a new one. However, more and more 360 games are being made available for Xbox One each week, so the legacy of the hardware will live on. Moving on now though, and the fifth official Minecraft convention, the cleverly named Minecon, will hit the Anaheim Convention Center on September 24 and 25. As in previous years, there will be interactive exhibits, keynote events, discussion panels, and the wonder that is the cosplay contest. Tickets are strictly limited, with half on sale on May 6 and the other half on May 7. If you miss out, you miss out. Each ticket must be assigned to a specific person at time of purchase in an effort to crack down on scalping and reselling. For more information and ticketing details, check out Minecraft.net. Another thing that is very popular, Dark Souls. This week we learned about a couple of different ways you can get your souls fixed and both of them have proved to be big sellers almost without trying. First up, there was a Kickstarter for a Dark Souls board game. The team at Steamforged Games asked for £50,000 and set the campaign to run for a month. That total was raised within just three minutes of the campaign going live, reaching a million pounds within 24 hours. Now backers are meeting stretch goals almost the moment the team announces them. You can pick up a copy of the game for £80 via the campaign website. The other Dark Souls outing, a comic book from Titan. A second print run of the book was hastily organised as the original run sold out almost entirely during its first day on shelves. If you rushed out for the original though, well done. The second run will feature new cover artwork, so your first run copy is an instant collector's edition. Another book that you might like, which has nothing to do with Dark Souls, is this stunning Metal Gear Solid 5 art collection from Dark Horse, launching in November with more than 180 pages of behind the scenes detail. And there's more! Wargaming has also announced a new project with Dark Horse, an epic World of Tanks comic book series written by Preacher author Garth Ennis and illustrated by Judge Dredd's Carlos Esquera. Set during the tank battles of summer 1944, it's German Panzers vs British Cromwells for this five-part monthly series, set to hit retailers and digital outlets in the second half of the year. Now, remember how we told you last week about how gender is now randomly assigned in Rust? Turns out that the handful of gamers who got very upset over that change are actually in the minority. Surprise! 
sales of the game have skyrocketed since the change. Overall player count nearly doubled for a period and sales increased by 74%. This is the sort of upswing usually associated with a hefty Steam sale, not an in-game update. And while creator Gary Newman isn't expecting the trend to continue, he's quite pleased with it at the moment. And finally this week, this is where we would normally put movie news, but instead we are going to dedicate a little time to the blast from the past that erupted this week. John Romero and Adrian Carmack, two of the men behind Doom, are making a new FPS. The name of the game is Black Room. Black Room takes place in the near future at the site of one of the world's leading tech companies, Hoxar. Hoxar has developed a technology that allows you to be anywhere at any time, creating fully realized holographic worlds that are indistinguishable from reality. All inside of a giant black room. Then something happened. You might call it a glitch. People are seeing things. Simulations are dangerously folding into others. You are Santiago Sonora, an engineer assigned to the Black Room project. You have no idea what's going wrong with Black Room until it happens to you and you nearly lose your life. Titled Black Room, we promise something that harkens back to classic FPS play, that is, exploration, speed, and intense weaponized combat. Expect dodges, circle strafing, rocket jumping, multiplayer features, and of course, modding support all set in a world full of holograms. The game is up on Kickstarter and pledges start at 5 bucks for forum access and exclusive streams and videos of the development process, to $29 for a digital copy of the game including an exclusive SATA weapon skin, all the way up to $10,000 for the ability to design an in-game holosim. We really want to get excited about this. Actually, we are a little bit excited for this, but there is one thing missing. Where is the gameplay? How can we believe that this really is the game we've been waiting for when we can't see what it looks like? For more information on any of these stories or to keep up to date with the latest gaming news, head to playerattack.com. But for now, stick around, we've got plenty more still to come. Let's fire up now, ladies and gentlemen, the first map of this best of 13 final. Navi will be attacking in the blue and hell races in the red to defend. A lot of people always ask me where I'm from. Some people can't stand the language, the accent, sorry. Some people love it, so you never know what you get out here. But it's definitely different to hear Aussie accent in the middle of uh, Poland. Well, that's the thing. You're an Aussie in Poland and you're a shoutcaster, essentially. How did you even get into this place? Yeah, well, I mean, I was started off like a lot of, a lot of lads, you know, Started off back in Adelaide, I was playing video games in my bedroom in my spare time, playing plenty of sport and stuff like that. My dad played uh, AFL for the Brisbane Bears, so we we're very much a sporty family, but um, went through school and uni, I was still playing games on the sides and, uh, you know, I started playing a lot of games actually, uh, sort of like 40 hours a week and I was practicing uh, with the team, sort of getting pretty serious about it, just competitively speaking, travelled a little bit around around the country, but uni started to creep in and take up a lot of my time, so I found that I was, really was one or the other, right, there was no way I was going to say, yeah, I'm going to be a pro gamer in Call of Duty 4 over my uni degree, so I was studying engineering at the time, so I stuck to the, the uni side of things, but instead I sort of took a step back from playing competitively maybe and just moving into yeah, commentary, which I'd never tried before, but a bloke uh, that I knew who ran like an online radio station asked me if I wanted to try it out. He was already doing it for Call of Duty 4, so it kind of worked. Um, so I had, a, I had a crack and it turns out I was pretty decent at filling a lot of the dead air in all these radio broadcasts, which was such a, a big issue back then when you don't have a picture to see, right? It's not video cast, not like this in there, it's just radio. So you have got to paint a mosaic for a person pretty much so they know what's going on. So. From there, I kept doing it. Managed to find a bit of a following, probably because I yelled all the time, I think. Um, a lot of people enjoyed just, just the excitement, I guess, that you get, I guess, supplementary to a game. A lot of people wanted to know what was going on in like the Call of Duty scene, so they would tune into the radio show. As time went on, you uh, you get a bit of more video content. You could video stream. I could never do that because Adelaide has crap net. Fix that, Turnbull, please. Um, so, yeah, I couldn't do much, but I had a mate who could stream uh, in a different state. So we linked up and I did some Counter-Strike and some League of Legends as well. Um, and then I got into Water Tanks. Right? That's when like, we started doing some stuff at PAX and stuff like that. And I got a hosting gig here and there, working with Wargaming, which was a lot of fun. I hadn't really 
done much with water tanks, but after that point, I started. I met a bunch of players, a bunch of Aussie pro players, and got to know them and learn about the game by playing with them. And opportunity came up to to work with ESL externally to do some events. Like they gave me a chance to come to Gamescom in 2014. I think they didn't pay me for it. I, I said, "Oh, like just get me over here." You know what I mean? Like little kid in the big smoke, like gonna go check it out. So that went well, and I did a few more of those events again. They asked me back a couple of times, but the travel from uh, Adelaide was pretty long, as you guys would not be knowing right now. Um, so eventually they asked me to stay and here I am. My God, Ollie, Ruenberg, <laughs> we've, this was kind of our demon all through the WGL season. We'd be sat there in the studio, Tuesday, Thursday night, we'd be like, this is going to be a 1-1, going to be a 1-1. And we were proven wrong more times than we thought here. Teams are adapting and this new meta, as we sort of labelled it, the new hotness on Ruenberg seems to lend itself to attacking teams who can innovate. What advice could you give them for somebody wanting to jump into the same scene as you and shoutcast? Yeah. I get asked a lot as well, if, if, do you have a background in uh, speaking or you know, improv and not really. I mean, ultimately for me, um, I just had a, I had a crack at it, right? Like a lot of people can keep a conversation. I find Aussies generally are pretty chatty. Like it's not hard to get us talking. I think we're quite genuine and open people. So having long conversations with people or conversations at all is pretty easy to do. I think for me, I just sort of had a go and like I put my stuff up on YouTube as well. And then nowadays as well, there's so much media to propagate your your content, your work, right? So for back at the time, if I'd been able to use YouTube and stuff like that, it might even have been a smoother transition. But all I can say is that you look at casters and you look at them talking about the game and you go, man, I can never do that. Well, I said the same thing I, and I just had a go. I just tried to listen a little bit. There's so much content available now for aspiring casters or as people who want to get into the industry in general that you can see what's been done before you. The road's been paved at least for you to get some self-development going in that sense. Um, you can see how people do it, develop your own style, which I think is more important than anything else. That's why a bloke asked me if I put it on an accent or put anything on. It's, it's not, it's just me as it should be for everyone. But um, watch, watch eSports, see how people do it and just back yourself as well. I mean, you might not be the hype guy, you might be the technical guy, right? You might be the, the different role, the brain behind the game. You might know a lot about the game and the mechanics and that's also really important as a caster and that's a whole different role in itself. So basically, a lot of it comes down to knowing your content, obviously. You can't just go in and make things up because that won't fly. How much time do you put into knowing the games you're talking about, like Tanks today, for example? Mm. With Tanks, it kind of worked out fairly well for me. Um, when I started getting into Tanks, I was playing it uh, and decided to just, uh, you know, go a little bit further. I managed to meet with some pro players as well when I cast some events and they're Aussies so we go to the event we just go have a beer at the pub later on and we were getting on like a house on fire in no time right that's the way it is and I linked up with those boys as well. I was at the time managing an esports organization called Mind Freak which is currently still I think the best uh, uh, Call of Duty team uh, in the country, but uh, at the time I brought them under Mind Freak as well, and I managed them for a while because I saw potential in the blokes. But I also got to sit and watch most of the games and hear their their callouts and commentary and play with them. So for me, I'm not a technical caster for World of Tanks. I'm not considered to be an expert. I'm not the guy that gives you the stats and figures. I'm I, the telling the story and the hype guy. But I had that experience behind me at least, which I think you should always have. I work full time as a caster, so I mean a lot of that is playing the game, which is the dream, of course. I mean a lot of time you, you do need to play the game. I watch a lot of VODs, I look at a lot of what other regions are doing, what other people in my position are doing, and I keep a good eye on social media so I know exactly what's going on in the industry itself. No light bulb yet, can't tell, he gets the spot, the shot comes in, I don't believe it, Inspira gets it done, and now the 1v1, Inspira, and Applewell, who's stuck on the side of a cliff. I'm here with Kelly, who we are at Adelaide Oz Comic Con 2016. Who are you? This one shares your name, but not our skill. People would know you from all sorts of places. The one that springs to my mind uh, most easily, of course, is Mortal Kombat, where you were Devorah, the bug lady. Right. And. You apparently forgot that you actually played the bug lady. Well, you know what? I, I, I actually forget that I do a lot of these kind of voiceover, you know, for video games. Um, partly because, you know, I am just forgetful. But mostly because a lot of these games are so well known that they, they have to do them under a pseudonym. So that, you know, like the, the crazy fans don't find out as easily. And then... Um, and then we shoot them and I'm in the room doing the voiceover for like one day for maybe a couple of hours at the most. You know, usually it's like 20 minutes and I'm out of there. 
but um, by the time the, the video game gets uh, released, there's been so much time in between that I completely forget that I played <laughs> this bug lady and that, you know, this video game is even coming out. Because she is awesome. I, 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 yeah, I don't like to think that you only spent 20 minutes with her. We've spent way more time playing the game. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I'm sure that that one was more than 20 minutes. I can actually remember taking some time just to try to find that voice. Because, um, you know, who, who knows what a bug lady is supposed to sound like? The hive protects its children. So do pissed off moms. You are brave despite the odds. But other than Mortal Kombat, yes. what other games might people know you from? Well, that, that you can remember, I know that's quite, I there's, there's quite a list. <laughs> well, I, I worked for over a year uh, doing motion capture on a game uh, from EA called Battlefield Hardline. So if anybody plays anything in the Battlefield series, that would be me. Yeah. So, but you're, you're not the, the big, tough white guy. No, I'm I'm me. They use my my image and everything. Yeah, <laughs> I don't I, I don't I, I don't know how to play video games, so I, I I don't know actually how to play myself. But um, but I hear it was really oh, fun. Look, can we talk about this? Uh, apparently, I was in a Batman game. Um, I did Red Alert three. Uh, oh, the very first voiceover that I ever did was one of the Star Wars games, Knights of the Old Republic 2. I would die for you when I tell you my life for yours. It is my choice. And if there is an ending between us when my sacrifice can save you, it will be because it is my desire, not your will. I think most people know me from Scorpion King or uh, playing Lady Deathstrike in... Um, in X-Men 2, uh, you know, at Comic-Cons, those seem to be the popular ones. Uh, I'm, I've been recurring on Arrow as uh, China White. Um, they still haven't killed me off yet, so I, I hope I'm still recurring. <laughs> um, what else? I've done um, a lot of really fun, iconic uh, roles in, in comics. I've been I've been really fortunate to have a, a career of you know kick ass comic book women. And and how bugs. <laughs> and bugs, yeah. How did you fall into the amazing kick ass comic book women role? Do you know, I don't know. I oh you know I do martial arts. I have a I have a black belt in karate, but I never actually took up karate thinking that I was going to use it for my career. It just so happened that way. And, um, and I kind of like it. I love beating up on boys. Yes. <laughs> and because you're doing it in, in comic books, that means you can wear way cooler things than, than a gi. Um, yeah, but it's also harder, you know, because us girls, they want us to be sexy. And so we're often um, more scantily clad. And, and heels. And in heels. And so we're trying to do all kinds of choreography with very little clothes on and high heels, which is really unfair because there's nowhere to pad us. How difficult is it and how much of it is choreographed? Um, it all has to be choreographed. You can't just let people, you know, like in a ring and just like go at each other. It has to all be choreographed. Um, and, and it depends on, on, you know, how big a budget the, the show has. Um, for like a big, you know, studio film like X2, where, uh, you know, you, you have... Um, this this huge set which was basically just built for the fight with me and Hugh Jackman um, you know we had probably about I guess three weeks or so to be able to you know rehearse that and learn the choreography and practice the wire work and all of that stuff um, but uh, but for TV shows where they're actually shooting much quicker at a much faster pace, you don't have that kind of luxury. So you have to learn combinations and learn choreography much quicker. 
And so then, so is is it like a dance, or is there any room for interpretation? Like, are, do you have to hit certain points, or is it every single move is all written down before? Yeah, if you don't hit the points, you usually get knocked in the head or something. Or you knock Hugh Jackman in the head. Yeah. You knock Hugh Jackman in the face. Ooh, that would be bad. I think all of Australia would hate me. Disney's forever positive, forgiving trademark rodent has been around for a staggering 88 years and during that time he has been featured in dozens of video games, ranging from a starring role in Castle of Illusion to a side character with a lot of importance in the Kingdom Hearts series. The world was first introduced to the character all the way back in 1928. In 1993, Mickey's 65th birthday, it was decided that a game would be released alongside Disney's other anniversary efforts as a celebration of the animated career of the cartoon mouse. Initially, they wanted to have the game released simultaneously with all the other Mickey merchandise that was designed for the anniversary. However, with the decision to make a game coming quite close to the required date, it would have only provided the development team six months to create the game, all the way from scratch to the final release. Thankfully, this idea was soon scrapped and the correct decision to take the extra time and create something actually worthwhile was made. The concept was to have Mickey travel back in time into his own history, reliving the adventures from his classic cartoons. That game was Mickey Mania. The game was finally released in 1994 for the Sega Genesis or Mega Drive, Sega CD, Super Nintendo and then again in 1996 for the original PlayStation with some extra bits and new graphic treatments. Mickey Mania is a platforming game that surprisingly provided quite the challenge for not only an 8 year old me, but also the 29 year old weirdo you're listening to now when I slap that cartridge back into my system. You bounce on baddies to beat them, collect marbles to throw at them, and try not to fall at the same jump over and over and over again. Welcome to platformers! The first animated short revisited in the game is Steamboat Willy, the first widely distributed Mickey Mouse cartoon. It's a docks level cleverly designed in black and white, keeping it aesthetically similar to the original short, but as you progress through the stage it slowly becomes more and more colourful, adjusting itself to the vision of the modern day colourful mouse reliving his past. The Mad Doctor is next, except in the creepy cobweb riddled dungeon that is home to several large bats and skeletons that spin their own heads off just before they explode. The bones fly everywhere and are random and each one is able to hurt you. This stage definitely gave me trouble as a kid, especially the showdown with the Mad Doctor himself. What a bastard. Moose Hunters follows, which is an unfortunately short level, which changes the pace as it forces you to slow down and be more wary of your surroundings as boulders will just fall right out of the bloody sky. You get to walk alongside Mickey's trusty pooch, Pluto as well, who becomes incredibly helpful when it comes to dodging the massive moose that gallops through the screen every so often. The stage ends with a great running towards the screen segment as you try to flee the aforementioned moose. Run Mickey, run! Up next is Lonesome Ghosts, which sees Mickey stuck in a haunted house filled with stairs that will turn into slippery slope the moment you step on them, ghosts that will show up just to generally hang out and ruin your day, ghosts that want to whack you with a huge plank of wood, and also ghosts that try to sneak up on you while in plain sight just before they lob lead lethal ghost hats at you like some kind of rejected Bond villain. Mickey and the Beanstalk is next, which is probably the most pleasant looking location we've been in so far. In a giant's paradise with butterflies and apples and holy crap the flower spit seeds at me! There's actually a final level to Mickey Mania based in 1990's Prince and a Pauper, but I just couldn't bloody get to it. 
this game is tough, despite it being seemingly a kid-friendly game, I just kept running out of lives, which was a welcome, if not frustrating, brick wall to hit when so accustomed to today's autosaving reload as many times as you need standard. Mickey Mania is a good game, but I wouldn't go so far as to call it a great game. Jumping can occasionally feel imprecise, the hitboxes that determine whether a projectile actually hits you or not aren't exactly spot on, which can be very frustrating when so many of the levels contain chucked items of some sort. Whether they're odd jobs, dead ancestors' hats, or bones that are flung about like a Mortal Kombat brutality, or even those poxy seeds, something will unexpectedly kill you. Whether you like it or not, However, it does look great and is animated well to accurately mimic the source material. In the long line of video games made just because something else is happening in a franchise, whether it be a movie or TV show or whatever, this is definitely one that had its heart in the right place, and for that I think I like it more than I should. Don't take my word for it though, try it out for yourself. The superior PS1 version is on the PlayStation Network store under Mickey's Wild Adventure. If you're looking for an old school platform game with plenty of challenge and the added bonus of a charming walkthrough cartoon memory lane, then this could just be something you should look out for. I've been Mike Nottridge, and I will see you next time. What's in your video game shoebox? And that's about it for this edition of Player Attack. Thanks for watching. Next week, we're off to the movies as Captain America's Civil War hits cinemas. And while Mirror's Edge Catalyst might have been delayed a little bit, again, we've got a hands-on preview to let you know exactly what you're waiting for. In the meantime, you can catch us at playerattack.com. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you've got something you want to say, send us an email, mailbox at playerattack.com, or just hop on our forums. Till next week, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this is Player Attack.